The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 11823 in the name of Gillian Martin on welcoming women in engineering day. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call Gillian Martin to open the debate. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Next week, on the 23rd of June, it's Women in Engineering Day. And I'm looking forward to a debate celebrating those women who are working in tech and engineering. I'm excited to hear other members telling the Chamber about the young women all over Scotland who are the engineers, technicians and designers of the future. I was hoping to spend the majority of my speech today concentrating on the positive efforts to change the engineering and tech landscape, rather than dwell on the fact that currently only 9% of the engineering workforce and 18% of the tech workforce is female. But it's important to recognise the problem of underrepresentation and to gently but assertively suggest what needs to be done and highlight systematic failings as we do so. That this debate was oversubscribed with speakers shows how important this issue is. But I want to start with a note of caution. I am a big believer in the power of women-only space to facilitate confidence and change. But I'm also a believer that a concerted effort to have 50-50 representation in forums in sectors that struggle to get women involved is important in affecting changes in attitude and perception. If you can't see it, you'll think you can't be it. And putting a photograph of a woman in a hard hat and a leaflet is certainly not enough. In the spirit of gentle but assertive suggestion, I would like to mention my disappointment that in my own neck of the woods, there was an event held at one of, to my mind, one of Scotland's most forward-looking and innovative universities, Robert Gordon's University, last week, on the future of oil and gas. 44 speakers were booked, only two of whom were women. What kind of example is this setting to young women and girls who might want to get into that sector? And how are we supposed to encourage women into STEM and oil and gas specifically if this is the kind of gender segregated image and environment that the industry itself is per per perpetuating? And I know there are great women working in oil and gas. It's not enough to say we need change. It's not enough to run programmes to encourage women into engineering and have them as an add-on. You need to include and promote women in your sector wherever possible in order to affect real change. You need to look at every public engagement, every workplace you operate in, and ask, what is the perception of the industry we're presenting? On a positive note, there are organisations who specifically exist and work hard with the sector and education to facilitate change. Organisations like Equate, representatives of which are in the gallery today, with tech mentors from Amazon. I believe that we are on an upward trajectory, thanks to the concerted efforts of organisations like Equate, and in UK, the STEMETs, and Skills Development Scotland. But it's a steep climb ahead if we are to reach the goal of 140,000 female engineers by 2022. And we definitely won't get to the summit without the sector having a quality of opportunity at its heart. Getting more women and girls into engineering is not solely an equality issue, however. It's also a case of economic survival for Scotland's engineering and tech sector and a key consideration as we seek to grow Scotland's economy. We do not know what the jobs of the future will be, but we can confidently predict that engineering, design and tech will always be at the forefront of whatever innovation drives the change in the working landscape. And women must be part of that. Last year, the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee that I, I am on did an inquiry into the gender pay gap. As part of that inquiry, we looked at sectors where occupational segregation was still an issue. Tech and engineering still attracts more men than it does women. And it can't carry on that way, as they just won't have enough people to power its future. There are key points where that sector loses talent. This is the infamous leaky pipeline. The first leakage occurs in late primary school, as the notion of boys and girls' jobs and gender stereotypes takes hold. Then, when higher subject choices have been made, we lose more girls. girls. If young women manage to avoid that leaking point, they may fall foul of another leak in the pipeline when choices are made for post-school education. At higher education, study point, only 16% of students of tech and engineering are women, but they've managed to at least get past some of the leaks. But say a young woman has taken the STEM subjects at school, chosen an engineering path 
pathway post school and enters the workplace after graduation. Many female engineers and tech uh, specialists only stay a few years in the sector. Looking at engineering modern apprenticeships, the numbers for 2015-16 were around 6% for female apprentices. For civil engineering, it was under 1%. But I am hopeful that we'll see an increase year on year as more concerted effort is made to attract girls into STEM and to encourage women returners and programmes to re-engage with the sector. And a bigger focus on companies to invest in more women through targeted recruitment and training and looking at their policies and procedures with a gender lens. SSE gave compelling evidence to the inquiry that by overhauling strategies for apprenticeships recruitment, they were able to increase the number of female applicants. But they had to. They needed technicians to replace the older workforce due to retirement and plug that skills gap. At the end of last year, I was excited to be a dragon on Dragon's Den. No jokes, please, Graham Day. <laughs> judging panel for one of the North East programmes to get girls enthusiastic about technology, design and engineering. And that was Shell's Girls in Energy programme. Girls from all over Aberdeenshire formed teams mentored by Shell's graduate apprentice, apprentices to come up with an idea for energy, their community's energy needs. It turns out they all worked on green energy ideas. And what would you know, that just happens to be one of Scotland's growth sectors. And of course, I must also mention that Turriff and Mintlaw Academy in my constituency did very well, been placed first and third, but before anyone says anything, there were other dragons. I wasn't stacking the odds. There are other programmes, there are programmes like this all over Scotland. Equate Scotland's summer placement scheme, career-wise, works to place female undergraduates in paid employment with companies. And I must also pay tribute to some of the employers who are actively working with Skills Development Scotland to recruit female modern apprentices. Earlier this year, I was at Sparrows in Bridge of Dawn to meet former pupils from my old school, Ellen Academy. I met Leanne Brown, who's a hydraulic te technician. Leanne could have gone to uni, but chose the apprenticeship as Sparrows offered her the skills and partnership to progress her study to a good degree stage while still earning. And she has the potential to work all over the world with Sparrows. I also met Caroline Gill, who is a drafts person with Sparrows, and I got a note today to say that she's passed her degree and is off to work in Singapore. In March this year, I met Kerry Taylor, formerly of Mintlaw Academy, who after two years of apprenticeship, and I am not exaggerating, has the skills to maintain and operate any part of Peterhead Power Station. And there are young women like this all over Scotland. I want to end by thanking Equate Scotland for their excellent briefing that the, the, they gave members and then the work they do to help us reach the target of getting significantly more women into engineering. And to those companies in tech and engineering who don't know where to start when it comes to encouraging more women to apply for their apprenticeships or their vacant posts, I say Equate should be your first call. Their Interconnect programme could just be what's needed to help you get the women who are going to power your organisation into the future. Uh, I do have a number of members who would like to take part in this debate. And uh, if we're going to do that, I'll have to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to a no more than 30 minutes. So I would invite Gillian Martin to move such a motion. Moved. Thank you. The question is that we agree to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are. The debate is therefore extended. However, can I say we are still oversubscribed and we're already over time, so I may have to cut the time of the speakers in the second part of the debate. Meanwhile, I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Right, thank you, presiding officer. I feel slightly guilty now because I was just asked in the last couple of hours to speak in this debate um, when Alison unfortunately had to pull out. So when I first was asked, I thought about it and I thought I remembered immediately the week that both my son and daughter both graduated from Edinburgh, Edinburgh University. My daughter received her degree in primary education with the hall predominantly filled with girls, whilst my son received his master's in civil engineering amid his predominantly male peers. So my first thought is that I hope one day that my children will sit at their children's graduations and not see such a gender dominate demarcation by subject. Saturday is International Women in Engineering Day, and it brings with it an opportunity to highlight that even though it is nearly 100 years since the creation of the Women's Engineering Society in 1919, many of their aspirations and concerns still hold as true today as they did then. Progress has been slow. 
2017 surveys show that only 11% of the engineering workforce is female, albeit a 2% increase since 2015. However, this is no longer a story about women not being able to enter engineering, because 61% of engineering employers say that the recruitment of engineering and technical staff with the right skills is a barrier to business, and yet 32% of companies across the sector report difficulties in recruiting experienced STEM staff, and 20% find it difficult to recruit entrants to STEM. The opportunities are there, but we must find ways to inspire women to follow STEM careers. This, I believe, is the challenge. So where do young women draw their inspiration from? Well, Scotland has its own engineering hall of fame, so I thought that might be a good place to start. However, only two women have made it to that list. Anne Gillespie Shaw, a production engineer and businesswoman who was inducted last year, whilst Dorothy Pullinger was inducted in 2012, the first woman. However, Dorothea's legacy did catch my eye because not only did she train as an engineer under her father during World War I and become lady superintendent, managing 7,000 female workers at Barrow, she was the first person and certainly the first woman car designer to see both the need for a different design of car for women drivers and also the design and engineering solutions to bring that about commercially. And she remains to this day the only person to design and take a car a, a, sorry, take into production a car specifically designed with women drivers in mind. So I thought, what did she think women needed that men didn't in a car? Uh, what made it suitable? Well, here we go, a rear view mirror, smaller, lighter with more storage space, a raised seat and a handbrake that's situated near the driver's seat rather than under the dashboard. Does any of this sound familiar? Because it did to me and I thought, aha, all cars are now designed for women thanks to a woman. But what I love about Dorothea Pullinger is that she didn't only design and bring the Galloway car into production, she also won the six Scottish six-day car trial driving it, proving that we don't just talk the talk, we also walk the talk. But she also created new training courses and apprenticeship specifically designed for local women. Well, why was that interesting and important? Well, she shortened them from five years, the usual five years, to three years, because they were, it was considered that girls were better at attending and quicker learners than boys, perhaps a note to current employers. She achieved this and more at a time when men dominated engineering and industry, and working women were often regarded as stealing a man's job. She was a woman of remarkable resilience and talent, a leader in recruiting women into engineering during the wartime, an MBE at the age of 26, and a founder of the Women's Engineering Society in 1919, an accomplished engineer in her own right, and a pioneer and inspiration for women in engineering. So the message now to women is you can change things, and people may not notice, they won't know, but every day of their life is, is affected by it. And I confess to my speech in an audience to the data science event in Edinburgh I, that I... really not, must come to a close. Okay, sorry. I hadn't anticipated enjoying the day, but it was in fact one of the most informative, inspiring and interesting I've events I've been to. So get into engineering women. <laughs> I call Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I remind members uh, I'm the PLO to the Education Secretary because I'm going to speak about schools at some point in my speech today. Um, I too would like to begin by thanking my friend and colleague Gillian Martin, MSP, for bringing this debate to the Chamber ahead of Women in Engineering Day this coming Saturday. In the last 60 years, the type of jobs required by the economy has shifted markedly. Consider the Rothes Pit in my constituency. Opened by the Queen in 1958, it was meant to provide coal until 2070. The pit was the main reason the town of Glenrothes was built, but just four years later, the pit shut down. Of course, 60 years ago, the type of work undertaken in the pits of Fife and across the country was not deemed appropriate for people like me. Specialist mining engineers were required to design and develop coal mines, but women were kept away from this process. In fact, in 1958, the Queen defied the age-old miner superstition of not allowing a woman to visit the pit. Coal mining and engineering itself was heavily gendered. So perhaps this historic imbalance is one of the reasons why engineering remains to present such a gender divide. Today, just 4% of Fife College's engineering students are women, and there remains a stereotypical preconception of what being an engineer means in 2018. As Leslie McCreary, an engineer with Scottish Power, says, engineering really isn't about hard hats and sitting down with rulers anymore. 
For Leslie, the problem starts at secondary school with gendered subject choice, something I witnessed as a class teacher myself not so long ago. Schools have a huge role to play in dispelling stereotypes and in promoting STEM subjects. In March this year, the government announced a STEM bursary of up to £20,000 for career changers to complete teacher training in STEM-based subjects. And in Fife, the college have started an Engineering for Girls programme, which has attracted over 5,000 female school pupils this academic year alone. And all of this is promising, but only 2% of automotive students at the college are women. As a former school teacher, I'm only too aware of the potential disconnect for, between school-based qualifications and those offered at our FE and HE institutions. And this was also highlighted recently by the work of the Scottish Government's Learner, er, Learner Journey Review, which was published last month. Today, Diageo is one of the largest employers in my constituency with their Cameron Bridge distillery and bottling plant situated in Leven. And since 2006, Diageo have recruited 158 modern apprentices into the company. Across the country, the company has 78 apprentices working towards qualifications in a range of areas from mechanical engineering to electrical engineering and coppersmith engineering, as well as in the science and technology field. 31% of Diageo's modern apprentices are female and the company hired their first female coppersmith engineer, Rebecca Weir, last year. Some years ago, fellow Pfeiffer uh, Gillian McBride was an engineering apprentice with Diageo. During her time at school, Gillian had a keen interest in maths and physics and technical subjects, but she wasn't really sure what she wanted to do after school. At the age of 24, Gillian was attracted to a future in engineering, beginning her journey with Diageo as a modern apprentice. In her third year, Gillian was streamed into the electrical engineering field, going on to work weekend shifts on the production line as an electrician. From there, Gillian's career has continued to progress, gaining experience of project management through a team leader role before entering her current position within the company as deployment manager. Over the last six years, Gillian has also been studying part of, uh, as part of a university course sponsored by Diageo, recently graduating with a degree in engineering management. And both Gillian's uh, ongoing success and Diageo's positive apprenticeship programme are certainly encouraging for the future of women's uh, role in engineering here in Scotland, but there is still work to be done. Because if we accept that subject choice in school is where career choice is decided, then we can't really ignore the recommendations of Equate Scotland's Rising to the Challenge report. And for our schools, Equate call for more regular talks and practical sessions from the industry for pupils. They call for more science ambassadors and gender advocates in every school and for gender and equality classes. Engineering has certainly changed since the days of the Rothes Pit, but age-old stereotypes of engineering persist. Gillian Martin's motion calls for action from within the industry, and I agree. From schools, colleges, and from the engineering sector itself, we need action from all fields to change the gender imbalance. Thank you. Uh, I can't stress highly enough, um, if people go over time, it's going to mean that others can't speak. So I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Ash Denham. I consider myself duly one presiding officer. Um, can I start by thanking Gillian Martin, as others have done, for bringing this important discussion to the chamber. Um, it's right that we're taking the time to welcome the women in Engineering Day on the 23rd, as it is indeed a fantastic day to draw attention to women in a heavily male-dominated field. But it's not enough for us in this chamber um, to spend just one day a year discussing it, because if we wish to see genuine gender equality in this industry, we must collectively focus far more on how we can help to achieve this. Now, Gillian Martin's motion correctly points out that the government's ambition um, is to have 140,000 female engineers in Scotland by 2022, a goal which I fully support. But can the minister, perhaps in his summing up, tell us where we've got to with this? Because according to research carried out by Equate Scotland, only 11% of Scottish engineers are women. Close the gap, tell us that 10% of managers in STEM businesses are women. It would be useful for the minister to tell us what those real numbers are rather than simply percentages. But when you consider that women make up 49% of Scotland's full-time workforce, it would be useful to understand how we will improve these figures in just uh, four short years and what action the Scottish Government is taking. Now, I recognise that encouraging women into the engineering workforce starts long before we advertise the job. Far more needs to be done um, to educate girls from a young age that engineering is actually an option for them. That they have the same opportunities as their male classmates to go on to STEM careers and that they can advance within those careers to the same extent as their male counterparts. I'm delighted to see Talat Yakub in the gallery um, because we have made a lot of this debate about the very helpful research that Equate 
have undertaken, because it's been helpful in understanding the challenge, because they found that regardless of academic capabilities, girls' interest in STEM subjects decreases dramatically as they go through school. Female students in secondary schools are often stereotyped into certain subjects, guided away from others. For those female st students who do dare to break the mold and study STEM subjects, they often find themselves quite isolated. They're the only girl in a class full of boys, being taught by a male teacher, learning about the work predominantly of male engineers, scientists, and mathematicians. It is harder to be what you can't see and striving to be in an industry with minimal female role models can be demoralizing. It's therefore hardly surprising that only 16% of female students in higher education are studying engineering and technology degrees. That's when we understand that the overall number of higher education students that were female was 57%. It's even more disappointing that of that 16% of higher education female STEM graduates, only 27% of these women actually stay in the industry. So that failure to encourage women and girls into engineering and other STEM subjects has meant that we've been creating unintentional barriers for generations of Scottish women, segregating Scotland's workers and denying Scottish industry the level of innovation and creativity that would undoubtedly be the result of a diverse and broad workforce. How can we as a parliament and a country brag of Scotland's first class industries? How can we convince others that we deserve our place on the world stage when a huge proportion of our population are being excluded from one of our most prominent industries and pigeonholed into careers that stereotypically are attached to their gender? So the task is a big one, I accept that. It's absolutely worth doing when you consider the skill shortages in engineering. And I would encourage the cabinet, the minister, I just promoted him, um, to achieving that target of 140,000 female engineers, not just reaching it, but indeed surpassing it. Thank you, presiding officer. I call Ash Denham with a seamless transition into Willie Coffey. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm delighted to be here today celebrating Women in Engineering Day, and thanks to Gillian Martin, my colleague, for securing debating time to discuss this. Um, this does have strong resonance for me, this issue, as I am passionate about increasing the number of girls and young women, both studying STEM, but also, importantly, staying on at work in that sector. Um, currently, the numbers for girls and young women, both studying and working in STEM, does, unfortunately, make for some quite disheartening reading. Um, and it's clear, um, I was also on the Economy Committee when we did the inquiry into the gender pay gap, and it became clear through that that possibly girls and their parents are influenced quite a lot by this idea of gendered occupational segregation, which generally sees young women being pushed into more traditional uh, female-friendly subjects and jobs. Um, and unfortunately, I think that is something we need to do a bit more about. Girls feel like they don't belong in STEM subjects. But I'm here to tell any uh, young girls or young women that might be watching this this evening that you do belong. And if you want to study chemical engineering or if you want to be a software engineer, um, that is exactly what you should go and do. And don't let anybody tell you you shouldn't do it or stop you from doing that. And we need to reflect on the fact that our culture does, to quite a large extent, minimise the contribution of women. And if I was to ask the members of this chamber this evening to name some influential engineers or scientists, how many of those would be women? Would they choose Patricia Bath, who developed the technology for laser cataract surgery, or Yvonne Brill, who developed satellite propulsion technology, or Mary Somerville, the Scottish mathematician and astronomer, or Marion Ross, the physicist, who became the first director of Edinburgh University's fluid dynamics unit? It needs to change. We need to celebrate female success in STEM, and I believe that will feed into more women making choices to study and work in that sector. And I want to briefly um, take the opportunity here to mention Myers-Briggs, which is a personality um, indicator. Um, I'm quite a fan of this. Um, it was developed by two women, Catherine Cook Briggs and Isabel Briggs Meyer, and it's a way for, um, it was developed as a way for women to work out which careers might suit them. So it's a free test, you can take it online, and I found the results to both be really accurate and helpful. Um, for finding out what different personality types might enjoy in their work. So if you haven't done the test and you're not sure about what career might suit you, that might be something that you might want to look into. Um, Equate released the report Rising to the Challenge recently, and that identified that regular talks and workshops from STEM industries and science ambassadors at primary and at secondary school level are particularly important in encouraging girls into STEM areas. 
and it's fantastic to see groups and programmes develop across Scotland that are facilitating this. So Women in STEM have developed the STEMettes, social enterprise that connects young girls with STEM role models, which I think is really good. And if you want to know more about that, the hashtag they use for that is Lassies in STEM. And I was encouraged to see that Edinburgh College, um, which has a campus in my constituency, has as part of their new gender action plan, a college ambassadors initiative. And this is led by female students who act as role models to young girls at school who are considering careers in design and digital technology. And also they've got the P7 STEM inspiration program which is teaching gender balanced cohort STEM subjects with the aim of normalizing girls studying STEM. And I myself initiated a STEM day, um, which included a coding workshop um, in partnership with Microsoft Scotland and Cortex Worldwide at Holyrood High School, which is in my constituency, um, I think it was in March, because I believe in the positive effect that this type of direct encouragement can have on girls. So I think we should do all we can to support and encourage girls and young women and give them as many opportunities in STEM as we can because they will then do the rest. Thank you. Call Willie Coffey to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Thanks, President Officer, and congratulations again to my colleague Gillian Martin for bringing this important matter of women in engineering to the attention of Parliament. Uh, recent figures do show a huge disparity in female participation in the engineering sector. I think it was 11% someone mentioned earlier. This places the UK, President Officer, as having the lowest percentage of female engineering professionals in Europe with while countries like Latvia, Bulgaria and Cyprus manage around 30%, not parity there either, but much higher than we seem to be achieving. We probably know the historical and cultural reasons for this, where engineering was, and perhaps still is, seen as a male-oriented profession. The oily rag mentality still persists and helps push many talented young women away from science and engineering as a result. Research conducted by the American Association of University Women points to a range of environmental and social hurdles, such as damaging stereotypes, the influence of gender bias, and the climate of science and engineering departments in colleges and universities. Sounds all too familiar. That's a huge loss to science, research and innovation, and we need to do more to turn this around, but all is not lost. The wonderful Kilmarnock Engineering and Science Society has been meeting in my constituency for the past six years under the stewardship of Professor Danny Gorman and was set up to provide a focus in science for school students and to encourage young women in particular to come along and hear about the wonderful achievements of women, some of them from Kilmarnock, who are leading in their field of science and engineering. Grange Academy in Kilmarnock can be proud of its former pupil and now the accomplished Dr Victoria Martin, who is an expert in particle physics, a reader in the subject at the University of Edinburgh, and who did some impressive work with Professor Peter Higgs. We also heard from Dr Carol Marsh, on the future for electronics and some amazing explanations of exoplanet atmospheres from Dr Mary Gorman. As well as the exciting work they do, all these women have shown our younger students that a career, a career in science and engineering is incredibly rewarding and offers the opportunity to travel the world. After winning an inspiration award, Dr Marsh said, we have to inspire girls to get into engineering, we have to encourage them to stay in engineering and promote engineering as a wonderful career. Currently, President Officer, we think we need to increase the number, of, uh, the number of people with engineering skills, and recent figures have estimated that the annual shortfall with these vital skills is about 40,000. There is much we can and ought to do to firstly encourage women to pursue their scientific interests and to show them that this field is one that they can thrive in. An invaluable way of showing women and girls that they can excel in engineering is to highlight the example of women past and present who have done just that. And the brilliant women who have kindly delivered their lectures to the Kamana Engineering and Science Society have given us that link so many of our talented young women students need. Real life examples from women who have made their way in science and engineering really helps young women to overcome the self-doubt and the misplaced stigma that many have that engineering just isn't for them. We should bring more of these inspiring examples to the direction, to the attention of, of women and girls through this kind of outreach. And the motion rightly values outreach as a tool for improving equality. And I'm fortunate enough to have some examples of this if it working effectively in my constituency too. My own background of software engineering, and while still needing many more men and women to take up that wonderful profession, is showing a steady but encouraging upward trend in the number of female students taking up degree courses in 
computer science, but the male to female ratio is still worryingly around 80-20. So congratulations once again to Gillian Martin on bringing this matter to our attention today. And I look forward to hearing the remaining contributions from other members. Thank you. Jamie Halcro Johnson, followed by Sandra White. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, can I congratulate Gillian Martin as well on bringing this debate to the Chamber. Um, the attention paid in recent years to opportunities for women in STEM careers has been welcome. For too long, there's been not so much a gap, but a chasm between men and women in entering these professions. I know that the efforts of the Women in Engineering Society will be welcomed across the Chamber, and this is the fourth National Women in Engineering Day uh, across the UK, and now includes an international dimension as well, with events spanning across the globe. Next year, the Women in Engineering Society will celebrate its 100th anniversary. And what better celebration could be imagined here in Scotland than one where we look to a brighter future for women, not only in engineering, but across the STEM professions as well. When the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee uh, considered the gender pay gap, it was clear that occupational segregation remains one of the, the most significant barriers to more equal pay between men and women in the workplace. These uh, uh, divisions sorry, became self-perpetuating a lack of representation in some certain professions or certain subjects is itself a barrier for those who may, uh, may be in a position to enter them. In October last year, in a debate led by the Committee on the Gender Pay Gap, pay gap I spoke of how early and how clear these distinctions can be in the minds of even very young children. This has the effect of narrowing horizons in ways that can endure for life. The outcome, the outcome has been, as the Scottish Government's STEM strategy recognises, female underrepresentation in STEM subjects that begins in schools, runs through colleges and modern apprenticeships, and ends with a sort of professional segregation that remains in place today. So it's welcome that the Women in Engineering Society is doing its part, bringing to attention the pioneering women in the sector, creating role models for the next generation. The Scottish Government's strategy spoke of joint action between agencies, as well as action at all levels, from primary education to the broad general education component to secondary education, then in, uh, into the senior phase. And that's a positive step. I feel strongly that opportunities in these areas have to be a core part of careers education. And there are considerable gaps there between strategic direction and what is delivered on the ground. And we must also consider the impact of policy on the opportunities for reskilling. In many cases, these opportunities have narrowed in recent years as further education has been cut back. In my recent members' debate on Apprenticeship Week, I welcome some of the work that has taken place in recent years to increase the headline number of women in modern apprenticeships. However, behind these figures, the divisions between individual apprenticeship frameworks remains extremely concerning. I remain of the view that targeting and the developing the young workforce strategy to reduce to 60% the, the percentage of modern apprenticeship frameworks where the gender balance is 75-25 or worse by 2021 is not an ambitious one. It is a concession that the majority of frameworks will remain enormously gender divided. That SDS is clearly bringing forward events to encourage young women into STEM uh, careers is again positive, but it risks being a piecemeal approach without the resource to reach across Scotland. We must create approaches that can bring the whole spectrum of careers and opportunities to every pupil in every school. I look forward to the expand, uh, expansion of foundation apprenticeships and give credit to Jamie Hepburn of the commitment to expand the range of frameworks available uh, across Scotland in future years. The inclusion of STEM frameworks, and particularly those in engineering from the beginning, hopefully demonstrates a willingness to use these apprenticeships to build skills in that area. By getting, uh, getting into schools across Scotland, all schools across Scotland, and showing pupils that careers uh, that can exist in a more direct way, we all stand to benefit. Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, as we celebrate this year's Women in Engineering Day, we have a great opportunity to point to the achievements of women in this industry, to build awareness and to help aspiration. I also commend the number and range of businesses that have been involved, as sponsors or in organizing events. But to make engineering more inclusive, policy must be ambitious, must, must reach all women at all stages of their lives and across all parts of Scotland. I call Sandra White to be followed by Graham D. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I also congratulate Gillian Martin uh, for securing this excellent debate. Uh, I want to concentrate on two parts of the motion. That is positive action measures that can be taken and also uh, a small mention in regards to the industry that reaches out for that. Uh, I, I know that I'm certainly meeting with Scott Trail uh, next week who are actually 
actively recruiting uh, women apprenticeships for engineering. So I thank them for that, and that's an example of it. But the biggest example and my biggest uh, contribution uh, I would like to mention is a fantastic project in my own constituency. It's a FEMEN Student Network. It was established in 2013 by Ellen Simmons, a biomedical engineering student at the University of Glasgow. FEMEN students have been running a programme of activities and workshops which they've taken out to schools, uh, promoting science and engineering as well. And as well as their outreach projects, they also have a number of other projects. It includes Future U. Uh, FEMEN believes that one of the main deterrents for female studying or considering to study engineering is the lack of positive role models, which has already been mentioned within the industry. And the FEMEN aims to bridge the gaps between the university student and the industry industry professional to try to give students an idea of where their degree could possibly take them, uh, getting away from the cloth and uh, oil rag as uh, Willie Coffey had mentioned. There's other ways to go forward in, in engineering. And one of the ways that they do that is that they host informal networking events and they call them Future You. Uh, these events, they invite successful female industry professionals and alumni to give a brief presentation uh, answering the questions of how did you get to where you are now? Uh, basically. Another project they have is the mentoring system, FEMEN's body, uh, buddy system, is designed to give younger students who have memberships of the society a way to ask questions about university to older students who are studying similar subjects to them as well. Uh, it's not a tutoring system, but students can ask any questions that they want to ask to their older partner students. Example, tips on how to revise for certain subjects, what a certain subject will be like, where can I get help with this, when should I start applying for internships, etc. And for the partner student in an older year, the buddy system gives them a chance to make friends in the younger years and pass on tips and tricks that they have learnt through their years, passing knowledge on basically. Uh, the help can be anything from occasional messages to meetings and in return they can be used for applications. They'll let you know how to fill an application and it allows students to become involved in FEMENG by helping other women in engineering. And finally, presiding officer, uh, one of the, I think the proudest things that FEMENG has done is FEMENG Rwanda. Uh, the project was born from a desire for the group to participate in projects overseas an international collaboration between the University of Glasgow School of Engineering and the University of Rwanda's College of Science and Technology. And this project has gone from strength to strength. And I must thank Ellen, who has went on to other work now, uh, full professional engineer and her fellow students, uh, for the drive and enthusiasm they've put forward in that. And the aim was for the possibility to open up science and engineering as a career to young women, not just here, but internationally as well. And I think it's a unique and progressive learning experience for everyone involved. And more importantly, it's engaging young women in the opportunities science can offer. I've been involved with FEMENG over a number of years, including hosting events here in the Parliament and a members' debate and highlighting the work which I and others uh, are, think they're mighty proud of. Thank you, President Officer. <laughs> Call Graham Day to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'm proud to have within my constituency the Angus Training Group, which the mi uh, Minister visited a few months ago. Since 2000, it's produced 629 engineers now plying their trade all over Scotland and beyond our shores. Of these, depressingly, just 26 have been women. That's 26 over 17 years. As the recruitment for this year isn't quite complete, the group isn't able to give me a definitive figure for 2018-19, but it looks like being 43 modern apprentices, of whom only three will be women. The group want to attract more women, they try to attract more young women, but the pipeline from local schools, uh, coming from local schools, uh, moves at a dribble. So I'm grateful to uh, my colleague Joey Martin for securing this debate, allowing me, as she did, to note the problem we have in my neck of the woods, but also highlight attempts to address it. In preparing for the debate, I was uh, heartened to learn that Angus Council has been taking uh, steps in primary schools to build teacher skills in science to motivate our young learners, and that in secondary, is careful analysis of gender breakdown in STEM subjects is taking place to support the targeting within school of interventions to encourage female engagement in science, as well as highlighting positive female role models in the field of science. 
1,000 Girls, 1,000 Futures is a groundbreaking worldwide initiative designed to engage young women interested in STEM and advance their pursuit of STEM careers through mentoring. An S4 pupil from Webster's High School in my constituency has been selected by the New York Academy of Sciences to participate in this programme. Uh, participants are, are provided with a mentor, most of whom are American female academics. Uh, beyond that, following a successful pilot of primary engineer in the Arbor Road West Coast, uh, cluster, developing the young workforce are funding their own pilot of this project in the Kirimur cluster, subject to positive evaluation, DYW Dundee and Angus are looking to roll the project out across all the Dundee and Angus schools. Primary engineer seeks to deliver the development uh, of children and young people through engagement with engineering, the promotion of engineering careers for pupils through inspiring programmes and competitions, the development of engineering skills for teachers and practitioners as a sustainable model, and work to address the gender imbalance in science and engineering. So steps are being taken. But statistics provided by Dundee and Angus College ahead of this debate, I think unequivocally reinforce the need for these actions because of the 2016 enrolment for, engin uh, for engineering across all the disciplis uh, disciplines, uh, 84 students were female compared to 1,550 males. That's a 5% representation. The college is tackling the gender issue through an in invitation to over 2,500 S3 pupils for taster sessions covering all curriculum areas at the college. They hope that this will go some way to exposing the pupils to subject options we'll see more girls choosing engineering, and as I indicated, we need that. Uh, on a, on the maintaining the positive uh, on this, there should actually be increasing opportunities for young women and men to get into engineering in Angus in the years to come. The Tay Cities deal will hopefully lead to an engineering centre of excellence being established in our broth. And we have, of course, also a significant Scottish Government-backed developments in the relation to Montrose and my colleague Marie Goujon's constituency within the last few weeks. So cause for optim optimism in Angus, presiding officer, but much work still to be done before we can honestly say that engineering in all its guises is truly open and welcoming to all. Presiding officer. Colleen Gray to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I thought uh, Gillian Martin made uh, uh, a noble effort to try and get us to uh, focus on uh, positive role models of, of women uh, engineers, but we failed that really, haven't we? Most of us uh, have spent uh, our contributions talking about the difficulties of getting women in, in, into engineering and the lack of women in the profession. And no wonder, because the figures are so stark, aren't they? And, Given the shortness of time, I, I, I don't want to rehearse those figures again, but I do want to restrict myself to, to two comments on um, how we change that and what we can do about it. And the first is to, in response, I think, in part to, to Ash Denham, who said that these figures are disheartening. I, I mean, I think they are disheartening. So it's important for us to tell ourselves, and I believe this to be the case, that we can change this, we can change it. And I think the evidence is there for us that it can be changed. If we look at professions like law or, or indeed medicine, which after all is a STEM-based profession, uh, those uh, professions have transformed uh, in recent years and become uh, gender balanced or uh, arguably in fact, in terms of uh, new lawyers and doctors coming through, perhaps predominant, slightly predominantly, uh, women and perhaps we should spend more time looking at why that's happened uh, and see why uh, it hasn't happened in engineering but I think it tells us that it can change uh, and the second thing is to say and a number of speakers have referred to this one way or another that our efforts have to be uh, early with young women they, they really do because I think anyone uh, who has worked in a school and a number of speakers have been in that situation who has tried to convince uh, young women, even in uh, S1, 2, 3, or 4, uh, that um, uh, 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 science and, and engineering is something that could be for them, knows how difficult it is uh, and how strongly uh, those uh, gendered attitudes are already embedded by that time. And I think the critical point there is the one that Jenny Gilruth spoke about, and that's course choice. Uh, and it is incredibly difficult, I think, at that point of course choice, S, uh, going into S4, to get young women to see that STEM subjects could be subjects for them. 
And I was very struck late last year when I was at a conference um, and one of the other speakers uh, was a woman called Zoe Thompson, who is a deputy head teacher uh, at Woodmill High School in Fife uh, and who herself has a background in electronic engineering. When she spoke about what that school had done in order to try and uh, change this. And what was striking uh, was just how much of an effort she believed had to be made. That school has a three-year gender uh, action plan. Uh, it has a huge focus on staff continuing professional development uh, because Zoe said that she was shocked at the degree to which many of her uh, colleagues and the staff didn't believe that this issue was really anything to do with them. That included workshops on addressing unconscious bias. It included weekly follow-ups, uh, which she checked people were reading. Uh, but it also included work with parents and pupils, exposing them to role models. But this is what really struck me. It also included the school rewriting the language and format of their curriculum choice materials to degender the language and changing the curriculum choice structure in the school to stop it squeezing young women out of STEM subjects. I don't think we can afford to be gentle or assertive. We have to be serious and intensive if we're going to make the efforts which will change this situation. Paul, well, the last of the open speakers, Stuart Stevenson, to be serious and, what was it? I wasn't aggressive, intensive, Mr Stevenson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, presiding officer, I will certainly not try and be too frivolous, but I will try and rise to the challenge that Ian Gray provided uh, and give some role models uh, in software engineering and some related uh, activities. And I, so girls do belong. And I start with uh, Ada Lovelace, who was Lord Byron's only legitimate child. She was born in 1815 and died in 1852. Uh, she was the computer program for Charles Babbage, who got a huge amount of money from the government uh, to develop the analytical machine and the calculating machine. She uh, developed the first computer algorithm and identified the importance of branching, in other words, testing and changing the direction of the program depending on results. Absolutely key to the way that software uh, works today. She was a mathematician, she was a computer person, encouraged very largely by her mother because her father fled one month after she was born and she never saw him again. Uh, born in uh, 1906 uh, was Grace Hopper. And Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, whom I had the immense privilege of meeting on the 5th of October 1972 mm -hmm. at the University of York, uh, she was a programmer on the Mark I American Navy computer in 1944. Um, that computer uh, had a partly electromechanical system and uh, one of her program runs failed and a moth was stuck between the contacts. The Americans call a moth a bug. That bug is sellotaped to her lab notes and can be seen in the museum uh, in, in New York and that is why we call computer programs have bugs because of Grace Hopper. But Grace Hopper, she did something incredibly important. She was the first person to develop a computer program that wrote computer programs, the first computer compiler, which today we utterly uh, depend on. Uh, Steve Shirley, uh, born in 1930, oh, by the way, sorry, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, re retired three times in the US Navy, and she was re-recruited because she was genuinely indispensable finally retired at the age uh, of 80, the oldest ever uniformed member of the United States uh, Armed Services, and then went to work full time for the Digital Equipment Corporation, where she was still working at the age of 85. Steve Shirley, uh, Steve Shirley, now she's actually Stephanie Shirley, and Steve Shirley used professionally the name Steve, so that the people she was dealing with would not know she was female and she developed a rather deeper voice than she might have naturally been born with when on the telephone. And she founded FI, Female International, one of the very successful early computer consultancies. And she's still around doing good works in the House of Lords. Um, the original NASA 
uh, bid for computers for the orbital manned missions. John Glenn did three hops around the Earth in 1962. Uh, the computer failed for three minutes during his three orbits because they only required 99.95% reliability and failures were allowed. So thank goodness Catherine Johnson, who was the orbital mechanical engineer, who was responsible for the mission, was there when the computer failed. That computer, because that's what these ladies went on as, uh, was still uh, there. And today in the NASA Langley Center, the director uh, is a female, the chief scientist is a female, and the chief technical editor, Pearl Rung, Young, is a female. There's plenty of places where girls belong in engineering. I now call Jamie Hepburn to wind up the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, join others in thanking Gillian Martin for bringing in this uh, subject to uh, the Chamber for debate? Can I thank other members uh, for their contributions, in particular Stuart Stevenson, who I never find frivolous but always uh, enlightening, uh, including uh, having found someone doing good work in the House of Lords. Uh, I didn't think I would ever hear that from one of my uh, colleagues. Uh, can I... Uh, See, this uh, debate also gives us the chance to uh, mark women who have made their, uh, their uh, mark uh, in uh, engineering. Uh, many uh, members uh, have, uh, of course, done that over the course of uh, this evening's uh, debate. Uh, I won't really rehearse uh, all the names, although I will say to Ash uh, Denham that I noticed a few of uh, our colleagues here, presiding officer, uh, a little nervous about the prospect of taking the Myers-Briggs test to determine whether or not that they should be in their uh, current career, so perhaps we'll all be doing that in uh, secret. Uh, I, uh, I fully support uh, International Women in Engineering uh, Day uh, because uh, it gives us that opportunity, but also it gives us the opportunity to recognise the Women's Engineering Society and the difference they're making in supporting women uh, in engineering uh, and the work they're doing to encourage and promote education, study and application of gen engineering and uh, in promoting gender uh, equality in uh, the workplace. Uh, we as a, a government are working uh, towards uh, those uh, aims. Uh, in particular, we're committed to addressing occupational segregation in the labour market in, in all its forms. But this is, of course, a, a sector where it is particularly stark uh, and prevalent. Uh, and of course, that's driven by many factors, not least uh, the uh, point that was made uh, by Jackie Bailey, that even where women do uh, study uh, STEM-related subjects, it doesn't lead to uh, participation or improved participation in uh, the labour market, open, some 73% of female STEM graduates do not uh, enter or remain in uh, that uh, sector. The first example, well, not the first example, but a stark example of the, the leaky pipeline that Gillian uh, Martin uh, referred to. That is a clear uh, waste of, of talent and an underutilisation of a particular skill set, something that we cannot uh, afford as uh, a country. We know uh, at school uh, that there is more to be done. We know that there is an interest at primary school uh, age. Indeed, uh, I, I, saw this, I see this very uh, clearly in my, my own daughter, who was extolling the virtues of learning about robotics at school, who uh, last night was very proudly uh, demonstrating to me uh, the roller coaster that she'd built uh, using Kinex. There are other brands available, I am sure. Uh, she was demonstrating the, ad demonstrating the admiral uh, patience and interest that I certainly wouldn't have had at that age and I will be doing everything I can to encourage her uh, to uh, continue that interest. I think that's a point that's been made by a number of members. It is our responsibility as individuals to encourage uh, girls at a very early age to uh, become interested in this, uh, this uh, sector and to sustain and maintain that interest so that we can, they can continue that interest to the other uh, stage of that leaky pipeline that Gillian uh, Martin uh, referred to something very clearly uh, recognised in the engineering skills plan that was published in 2015, where the interest uh, begins to drop off at uh, secondary school. The number of passes by girls in the main uh, STEM higher qualifications has uh, improved, but we do know that we need to do uh, more uh, to uh, improve in that, uh, on that. Uh, we can take action, like uh, Ian Graham and Optimist, we can take action to improve in this, and we have been taking uh, action to improve in this. Uh, we uh, took forward the Improving Gender Balance uh, project with Skills Development Scotland, uh, Education Scotland Institute of Physics to, to challenge stereotyping in the school environment. That project finished 
at the end of March. Its interim evaluation has been uh, published. It, it has demonstrated that evaluation has demonstrated greater awareness amongst teachers and senior managers of unconscious uh, gender uh, bias, how that can manifest itself within their activities in the school environment, indeed greater awareness of gender issues amongst learners and their willingness to come forward and challenge any uh, manifestation of stereotyping or such as throwaway remarks than they might have in the past. And uh, the evidence that this approach has made a difference was actually starkly put into demonstration by Ian Gray's contribution, where he, where he specifically cited Woodmill High School and their change practice they actually were part of that project, which says to me that that's exactly the type of activity we need to take forward. And the challenge for us will now be uh, to roll out that uh, learning uh, going uh, forward. Jamie Halcrow-Johnson, one of the other ways I think we can make a difference in uh, schools is through the uh, element that Jamie Halcrow-Johnson brought to the debate about foundation uh, apprenticeships. We are uh, growing the range, uh, a number of such opportunities. We're committed to doing that. We're growing the number of potential starts this year to 2,600 opportunities from 1,200 last year. We're committed to moving to 5,000 in next year. And that's important. Uh, clearly, we, it is very important for us to ensure that uh, girls are picking STEM subjects in the school environment, but where they don't, a foundation apprenticeship can give them another opportunity, presiding officer, because they don't have to have chosen that as subject matter. And if they uh, come to express an interest in working in the sector later on down the line, and they haven't chosen those subjects, a foundation apprenticeship gives them that opportunity uh, to, to get into uh, the sector. Uh, there is much more uh, that still needs to be done uh, in uh, universities and colleges. Uh, we have heard some uh, good examples uh, this evening. Sandra White talked about the University of Glasgow. Uh, Jenny Ogilruth gave the example of Fife uh, College. The Scottish Funding Council has set out its Gender Action Plan, which sets out the ways in which colleges, universities and other partners have to collaborate to address gender imbalances within uh, those subjects where there is such an imbalance. Uh, modern apprenticeships, we have the Skills Development Scotland's Equalities Action Plan, which is designed to address a range of imbalances, not least amongst them uh, gender imbalance. We have a long way to go in that regard. I do not shy away from that. Uh, that is most starkly demonstrated, I think, President Officer, by the fact that uh, if you actually take away uh, construction related frameworks which in obviously includes engineering we have a, a majority of participants in uh, modern apprenticeships are female but overall the participation is 60 percent male to 40 percent female which shows the, where the clear imbalance comes from i have to say if ever there was a way of promoting the benefits of uh, a, an apprenticeship to any one it would be to go along with graham day to the Angus training group, which I was very happy to do so, not only to see the tremendous training that they put in uh, place, but, and I know that money isn't the only motivating factor for uh, any person getting into their career, but when you speak to those uh, apprentices, their earning potential after they not long finish their training is uh, significant, is well ahead of median earnings. So again, uh, that can be a another way that we can promote this sector to a wider uh, range of people. I'm up against time, uh, President Officer. I would have liked to go on to speak a little about the work we're doing with Women Returners Projects, with Equate Scotland, uh, and, and other, rain, other ranges of activity that were taken forward through the, the Workplace Equality Fund, through the Prevention of Maternity Discrimination in the Workplace uh, Working Group uh, that I have put, uh, that, that I'm taking forward, and through uh, the Fair Work Practice, we're seeking to promote more widely. But let me uh, say, I recognise that the uh, that the uh, road that we have to travel is, is still uh, significant. We've begun to take those steps, but I'm determined we get to the end of it to ensure that we have uh, a far better and far more equitable uh, participation in engineering uh, m across the range of our population so more women can get that chance. That concludes the debate, and this meeting is closed.